I wasn't just watching a show. I was watching my own life play out on TV. Hi, my friends. It's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I want to talk to you about the last three episodes of For Life. I was making these videos weekly, and then other things have come up. I've gotten really busy during quarantine, and I never got a chance to make a weekly video about this, so I figured I would come in while I had a little time. It was on my mind. And the last three episodes, I think, are good to lump together because I don't want to go through scene by scene like I've done in the past. I just want to talk to you guys about the things that stick out to me. So if you're interested, it's a really good one. There were riots and all kinds of stuff going on in this one. Ugh, anxiety just at the thought. Please keep watching. If you're new here, my name is Ro. I'm the founder if you're new here, hi, my name is Ro. I'm the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Wives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. We don't glorify or glamorize prison or prison wife life here, but I will teach you how to make the best out of this really painful, awful, but hopefully one-shot deal. Like I said, I've been going through episodes of the show for life which was amazing i'm only saying was because the season finale just happened and then there's time off before i'm assuming season two i hope season two there needs to be a season two this show is all about a man that was sentenced racially discriminated against and framed and he wound up with a life sentence in fact the true story he wound up with a life sentence in new jersey but the show is based out of new york state prison regardless it's still a life sentence in state prison that he wound up overturning getting overturned so in this third to last episode there was a riot it was awful to watch as i was watching i was laying on the couch and i realized i'm like i have chest pains i mean not like literally but the anxiety as i was watching it and i thought to myself this is why i don't love to watch prison shows and shows like this because it really plays with your emotions but then again for me in this instance knowledge is power and i get to empower myself obtain that knowledge and then share that knowledge and that power with you we need that the more we know the more we can advocate on behalf of our loved ones i'm telling you that because that's why i was able to stay and watch this that doesn't mean that you have to watch all the prison shows that doesn't mean that you have to ruminate and put yourself in situations where there's so much anxiety while you're watching this stuff like for example lock up raw i used to watch that all the time while i was in the hotel rooms waiting for a visit the next morning because i have to drive the day before because it's six hours away i say this all the time but god bless the men and women who drive overnight to get to the facility for visit morning i've never been able to do that because if i lose sleep then i just turn cranky i turn emotional and it would not be a good visit for us i'd probably wind up in jail or divorced before i even get married in jail not as a visitor let me clarify if i'm joking but it wouldn't it just wouldn't be a pleasant visit for us and it's kind of what's the point so i go to visit less i save my money in between and then i go when i have money saved that i can get a hotel room for the night before so i would watch that show and i would get so anxious partly because it was the only thing that was on tv and partly because i felt like i needed to know all this stuff and if i watched it, i felt closer to him but really at the end of the day all it was doing was making me scared for his life every single day and it was hard for me to engage in my own daily life because I have one foot inside of the prison world that I've never even experienced. And that's kind of what I felt like with this. As I was watching the riot, we hear about riots all the time. There was a riot that happened in Allenwood when Adam was there. I'm looking in my rear view mirror because there's a whole the family of deer behind me. It's beautiful. Adam was telling me about this riot where I had gotten back in touch with Adam about two or three weeks after this riot they went on lockdown for like a month after that so he was saying that he literally feared for his life he did not know if he would live through it or not it was that bad and i never really really understood what he was talking about until i saw this episode so as i'm watching it i'm like <gasps> watching things happen blood and gore and it, everything you imagine a riot to be happened during this and it reminded me of the mississippi riots that i talked about way back around christmas i'll 
put a link to it up there because those are the really bad ones where it was like one person after another was losing their life and it wasn't stopping. It was happening for a matter of days, even while they were on lockdown. It was so scary and so crazy. And these are the things that we as prison wives fear because these are the realities of our lives that I think a lot of times people who are new to this, people who find loved ones on pen pal ads, they think that street life is glamorous and it's fun and they're being with an inmate will protect a woman. They don't realize when they're getting into this how deep it goes and how much anxiety we live with day in and day out, especially if you have a loved one who's in a super max or a maximum security facility or in a facility that has different levels and they are in a very high level within this institution, especially, and I am not negating the struggle that anybody has who's in prison, but especially in my experience, West Coast prisons are super violent, West Coast and Florida. And I'm not saying that all the states in between don't have violence and don't have a lot to deal with. Florida, Mississippi, I should say, and West Coast are the worst of the worst of the worst. And I've heard that from people doing time inside of prisons in states in between those two or three states. So that was basically the third to last episode. The whole thing was all about this riot. That's really what stood out to me. I watched it so many weeks ago that that's all I remember about that episode, but that's a lot. It was just a lot of emotion and a lot of anxiety and like paranoia and short breaths and, and like tight chest while I was watching it. And I went to bed feeling like I got hit by a truck. So then the next episode was just as emotional, just in a different way. So the warden is such an incredible woman it reminds me of a warden that was where adam is now years ago i used to call it the girl power years because it was a warden an assistant warden and the warden's assistant if that makes sense so the warden's kind of like secretary administrative assistant but also an aw an assistant warden were all women were all amazing all pro inmate they flexed when they had to they instilled the rules when they had to but they also wanted the inmates to thrive and so this warden in this show reminds me so much of that warden adam said the same thing because he started to watch the show this episode caused a lot of anxiety it could be quarantine depression but i cried the most during this episode than i did throughout the whole entire season because this is just the reality of our lives they changed wardens because a corrupt administration came in so they were this good warden was trying to get Aaron off of the property because they were putting everybody in the hole that had anything to do with this riot he was there the warden knew that he had one chance to go to court and get his case overturned and that was supposed to happen the following day so she's like she was losing say so she said to her cops get him off the property now before they have a chance so then it shows you how he's on the bus the cops are trying to not let the bus leave the building. It just shows this tug of war between good cops and corrupt cops. It shows just how out of control our own lives are and our loved ones lives are and how they're in the hands of other people and it is so emotional because I wasn't just watching a show I was watching my own life play out on TV there are so many times in Adam's life trial everything but in just my relationship with Adam alone I came in 10 years into his incarceration and even for the past actually 11 years at this point that we've been together there are so many things where it's right there and we miss it because it's a huge opportunity and we miss it because of somebody's corruption there are also times that somebody is pulling for him as hard as they can and pushing for him as hard as they can because they believe in him and they know that he doesn't deserve what he got but then somebody up above somebody with a corrupt agenda somebody that just doesn't know him and everything that he's done and he's just a statistic or one of the bad guys will pull the rug out from under us and as prison wives and family members this is what we experience all day every day this is what we experience this is the anxiety that we face our lives are not in our own hands our lives 
are left up to the people who are in control of our loved ones, whether they be the good ones that are fighting for us, like this warden and the warden that I'm talking about at Adam's facility, or it could be the corrupt ones that just want to make a name for themselves and move up in the ranks and potentially get more stripes. Not that they really get stripes, but you know what I'm saying. And they don't care who they hurt. They don't care who gets killed in the meantime because they're putting people in different blocks. They're putting people in general population. They're actually closing their eyes and allowing rumors to spread about Aaron and then about to put him on general population where people think that he's a rat. They know exactly what they're doing. Their hands are clean, but they're basically feeding him to the wolves. It's like they're opening up the door and pushing him into a lion's den, closing it so they don't have blood on their hands and these are the facts so i don't know why this turned into this but what i'm feeling coming up as i'm speaking through this is if you're interested in getting into a prison relationship and meeting somebody who's already incarcerated this is the reality of our life and this is what we go through on a daily basis this is probably why i have so much gray hair and i'm starting to get wrinkles i'm really kidding but in a funny way or in a self deprecating silly way I'm saying that this is the stress that we face day in and day out until you have your loved one home even if they have a good warden doesn't matter maybe somebody up above her head in the feds we have central office maybe somebody up there maybe the district judge maybe somebody in a different facility does not like inmates has something against your loved one you're screwed and their life is in that person's hands and your future is in that person's hands. Oops, I dropped my phone. Maybe I shouldn't bang on the steering wheel as a prop. So the way that the second to last episode ended was with a quote and it was so good because the warden's getting pushed out of her position. This whole riot is being blamed on her even though it was the corrupt officer that got caught bringing drugs into prison and starting this whole basically war inside. So now she's getting blamed for this and she's kind of having to take a back seat and step out of that role. And she says, I'm paraphrasing because I couldn't type as fast as she was talking, but basically she said, can one person make a difference? I'm not sure, but the only thing to do is pass the baton when the time is right and hope that they can do better than you with the same passion. Then she goes on to say, maybe she was put in that position to help Aaron Wallace because nobody ever doubted that he was innocent. So I love that quote and that could be implemented in any area in life go hard go after what you believe in with passion and then there will come a time where you might have to pass the baton you might be forced to pass the baton and the only thing that you could do is hand it over and hope that that person comes at it with the same passion that you have what happens the day that i can't handle strong prison lives and families any longer. I don't foresee that in the near future or even in the foreseeable future, but what if that day comes? The only thing that I'll be able to do is pass that along to somebody else and hope and pray that they will continue with the nonprofit organization with the same fire and passion that I've had for all of these years and the same passion that I have to help prison wives, to help them face this and not feel alone and not feel like they can't go on another day. This series was incredible. I cannot wait for season two. I cannot wait to reach out to Isaac Wright Jr. I know he works at a law firm not too far from me in New Jersey. I just was about to reach out to him as soon as quarantine started because I'd love to be able to interview him for you guys. Could you imagine? If you are interested in other videos that I made about this series, I will link the playlist right up there. And if you're not already subscribed, do me a favor and click that little circle. Or you could also subscribe by clicking that little red box below. Give this video a thumbs up. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want me to watch another series and make videos with my response, just let me know what you want me to do it about. I love you guys and I'll see you on the next one.